Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. Today I want to talk about this. This is the remote control for the garage doors of the building and also the main building's gate. So whenever you press the button, the garage will open and then you can park your car. Every resident of this building has these remotes if they want to access to the building. And I wanted to know if there's a lot of security in this remote, sys remote control system or if it's very easy to clone. So this is the device. Um, we don't have a lot of information about it. Uh, there's nothing written on it. There's just one button. We don't know at which frequency it operates, uh, who is the manufacturer, or things like that. And even if we open the device, up, this is the opening. Well, this is the back. So, uh, there's not a lot in there. There are some codes, some battery, and even if we take the plastic off, so this is just plastic for the button, and on the other side, we look at the device, um, there's not a lot of information on there, or a lot of components, there's one microcontroller, one crystal, one button, some unpopulated chips, but it doesn't seem to be anything fancy. It also doesn't tell us anything about the remote itself. Um, we don't. We still don't know at which frequency it operates or who is the manufacturer of these devices. One way to figure out at which frequency it operates would be to take a software-defined radio like this RTL SDR. So that's a very inexpensive software-defined radio which you can get for twenty dollars. And then plug it to the computer, press every time, and see on the spectrum if there's some activity running on. Um, this is. A very hackerish way, which is not efficient and you will have to spend some time. Uh, a more efficient way would be to gather first information about the device itself. So we want to have more information about this device, but the device itself doesn't provide any information. So what I did is just go around the building and because this is the center, there, have to be, there has to be a receiver at the other end. So I looked at the main entry, at the garage entry, which device could receive it. And I didn't find a lot, a lot of information, but at least I could find which is the company doing it. So just by running around, uh, so just by looking around, I could already find the manufacturer, but this is not enough. We have to find more information about this remote. Um, since this is used in the US, in the US, whenever you have a remote transmitting signals, you have to get accreditation for the FCC. Where you, ex where you show that you respect some regulations. Um, on the device itself, there's nothing written, but if you look at the back here, there is space for a sticker. This doesn't have the sticker, but what I did is just ran around again the building and this time asked the other residents to look, to have a look at their remotes. And after some time, I found someone which has also a remote, which is a bit different. Um, this one has one button, this one has four buttons, but if you look on the back, then you will see this, uh, this has a lot more information. So, it gives you at fre frequency you're operating, 318 megahertz, and this already helps a lot. What it also tells you is that it's from Linear Corp, and that the model is ACT 34B. This is a very good start already and this will uh, save us a lot of time. Now that we know that it operates at 318 MHz, we can use the software defined radio and have a look at what it transmits. So I will use my TLSDR dongle, back it in the computer, there's the antenna, and I'll just press on the button. Um, to see the traffic, I just use a tool which is called SD Range Love. It's, uh, Quite convenient Linux tool which works well. So we start the acquisition, acquisition starts. Um, we set 318 megahertz, because that's the frequency indicated on the remote. And then the sample rate, I set it to 1 megahertz to have a better refresh rate of the graphic. And now, simply press on the button and see. Ah, and here we can see some quite clear traffic. So on top we have the fast Fourier transformation, which indicates at which frequency the signal is transmitted, so it's around 318 MHz, it has a small offset. Um, in the middle we have the waterfall diagram, it's, the idea is the same as the fast free transformation, but it also has the time component, and we can see 
the fast rate transformation just falling down. That's why waterfall diagram. And on the bottom, you just have the components of the signal. So we can see the signal is quite easy, and um, there are peaks of transmission. This indicates that it uses just amplitude modulation and simply on off, no no intermediate frequency like Morse code. As the range level allowed us to verify that it's really at 318 MHz and it gives us the next piece of information that it's probably simply pulse code using amplitude modulation. So now we want to record the signal to have a deeper look and to find a pattern. Um, SD range love doesn't allow us to to record the data, but there are other tools which use the Osmo SDR driver and can talk to the RTL SDR. So the next tool is simply RTL FM. Up oh, RTL FM, and this is a very simple program which is actually used for FM demodulators using this RTL chip, which you can find in the RTL SDR. So we'll simply RTL FM, specify the frequency, 318 MHz, specify the modulation, it's AM, then we simply put it, the raw captured data, into test.pcm file. So it starts, software defined radio, the dongle, press several times on the button, just to have several signals, and then we just need to open this raw data. You can do it, for example, with an audio editing tool like Audacity. So we start Audacity, File, Import, Raw Data, Tab, Test.pcm. Um, it's the this data is saved in signed 18 bits PCM. Um, it's just a specification of this RTL FM tool. But the sample rate, as you've seen in the output, is 24 kilohertz and it's only one channel, little endian. So these parameters are quite important if you want to decode the data properly. And here we have the data decoded. I pressed four times on the button and we can see four bursts. We can just look inside the burst. And then we have the, the clear patterns. Now we want to figure out, so this is probably just pulse code modulation, and now we want to figure out what the encoding is and what kind of data is, is transmitted. We could just, um, we know where the bits are, but we have no idea what the modulation is. We can see that actually the distance between two pulses are quite regular. So either we have here six milliseconds, or we have three milliseconds, or we have nine milliseconds. Um, and this just repeats all along until here, where here we have a longer space. Probably this is a second transmission, because if you look, edit, you will see that it's, the pattern is quite similar between this burst and this burst. So it's probably two transmission of the same signal. And if you count the number of pulses which are in the signal, you will find there are 24 pulses. And that the interval between the pulses is quite regulated. So we have 25 pulses within 150 milliseconds. And they have either three Millisecond separation, six milliseconds, or nine milliseconds separation. Oops. This is good start, but we want even more information. So we want to find more about the encoding. And we have some already looked at the signal, but maybe the manufacturer will tell us some more information. And this is why it was important to get the sticker on the back of the remote. So we know it's a linear product. Linear remote control. Let's Google that. And yes, linear corp, as we saw. We click on the linear corp link and see what products they have. They have lots of radio control, but we are only interested in the ACT 34B. And we can see here the ACT 34B. But we're on the right path, and it already gives us the link to the manufacturer. So we see four buttons again here, 318 megahertz, 
number of codes, 1 million codes. Well, in 24 bits, you can store 1 million codes. Read more. Nothing interesting. Again, only 380 MHz. Here, the order number. This is also what we saw on the back of the remote. Let's see about the documentation. Installation manual. Let's have it downloaded. And here is just a manual which again tells the same thing. So it uses the linear mega, it's part of the linear mega code series. So the encoding is probably the mega code encoding. Um, it's the ACT 24B, and you can see it has a small sister, the ACT 21B. So this is a remote I have with only one button. The other one has four buttons, which they also called four channels. It has some ID encoding, some block coding, but else it doesn't tell you a lot more information. Inspect here, important radio control, provide reliable communication, then it talks about the FCC. And this is a very good thing in the US, Is and we've seen it on the remote, is the FCC ID. Remember, on the back of the remote, we found the FCC ID. Um, in the US, whenever you have a radio transmission, you have to be compliant to some regulations. And the FCC ID allows you to read the documents where this compliance is described. So if you look at the back, we'll, so let's go on the website, FCC ID, FCC ID search. The website is a bit slow, but it still works. Redirecting. Please redirect me. And here. So on the back we saw EF4 and then the product code being ACP00872. And this is also the part number uh, which we found on, on the bottom of the product code. So it quite matches what we need. Search. And here we have it. Uh, we, we see again linear. Um, we so the FCC ID matches, and then if we see here, 318 megahertz. This is exactly what we what we found. So if you look at the details, okay, there are lots of documents which are all quite interesting. But let's have a look at the test report first. So this describes it complies to the FCC rules part 15 for radio communication. What's interesting is here the modulation. Modulation in pulse position A1D AM modulation, amplitude modulation. And then if you look for the type of modulations, A1D stands for A is double sided double sideband amplitude modulation, so AM. One stands for one channel. Well, we only, um, as we saw in the specification, it's only 318 MHz. And D means data transmission, telemetry or telecommand for remote controls. And so it's simply AM signal or on, on or off, like on off keying Morse code. And here they say it's pulse position. If you seen it, we have different position of pulses, either 3 milliseconds, um, 6 milliseconds, or, or 9 milliseconds. That already helps a lot. <clears throat> but what's even more interesting, so here we can see a bit more compliance, which is less interesting. But what is more interesting is we saw that they're telling it from the mega code series. And here we have two mega code documents. And if you look at the mega code documents, it tells you exactly how the transmission happens. And let's have a look at the second document too. <coughs> ah, wrong way around, rotated. And here we can see how it transmitted. And you see again, we have 24 bits, like we saw in um, Audacity when we decoded the signal. 24 bits, so this corresponds to the mega code timing diagram. And here they say that there is there are 24 pulses. So the first pulse it's a sync pulse, and the last pulse, the blank cell, is just uh, a cell with no pulse. But each other cell 
So each 20 cell and then three data bits have pulses, which are every time one millisecond broad. And this one millisecond is within six milliseconds. This also corresponds to, to what we see, because if the maximal difference we found was nine milliseconds and the minimum is three milliseconds. So it could be, and we also find six milliseconds. So this could be, uh, this could represent this. If we look here, there's a bit more description. So 25 pulses, the last one being not a pulse, pulse key carry, keyed carrier, so either on or off. Each pulse is one millisecond long. This we've already seen. And then one pulse occurs within a bit frame of fixed six milliseconds. And if you add uh, 25 times six milliseconds, you'll come to the 150 milliseconds we saw. And yeah, 24 bits of, of information which are sent. And so we know from this document that there is one pulse every six milliseconds. Um, we know that there are 24 bits. So there's a sync frame, 24, uh, 23 bits actually, and a 24, which is just a blank cell. We have three data bits and then we have the system code. And this gives us actually quite some information. If we go back to the signal we recorded, we can see one signal. So this is the one millisecond pulse. And we can see here one millisecond, which happens within six milliseconds. So if you look here, it's around eight milliseconds. <clears throat> here there is a small gap, or only a small gap, which is around three milliseconds. If we look beginning to beginning, it's three milliseconds. Sometimes we find six milliseconds. Sometimes, again, we find nine milliseconds. But we know there is one pulse every six milliseconds. And the position of the pulse is uh, important. So within the six milliseconds, the, it's either the position depending on the previous pulse or the position within the six milliseconds. And if you look at it, because we have either only three milliseconds difference, six milliseconds difference, or nine milliseconds difference, actually, what it means is that if the pulse is within the three milliseconds of, if the burst is within the, uh, the three milliseconds of this six milliseconds bit frame, then it's probably a zero or a one. And if it's at in the next three milliseconds, then it's a one or a zero, depending on the encoding. And this is how they, they encode the signal. This is also why we can see, uh, we can see uh, the bandwidth, uh, the, the time difference is being three milliseconds. So here we have one pulse. Uh, one bit frame of six milliseconds. The pulse is in the second half of this bit frame. In the first half, there is no pulse. Here starts the new pulse. Again, six milliseconds, and here the pulse is in the first three milliseconds of this six millisecond bit frame. This is why also we only have three milliseconds difference. So this is six milliseconds, this is six milliseconds, and then this is again six milliseconds, and we can see here the nine millisecond difference comes that because either the pulse in the previous bit frame was in the first half, and the pulse in this bit frame is in the second half. This is why we have either three milliseconds difference, six milliseconds difference, or nine milliseconds difference. Now we know how the encoding is done, and we want to to decode this signal, which is, so we here we have the 24 bits. This is the sync bit. These are the 23 um, data bits. And then there is a last blank bit. The code is repeated again. We can, the, you, as you can see, the pattern is the same. So now we, we found the encoding, thanks to um, the documentation and a bit of thinking, and now we want to write a software which does the encoding of this data for us. To decode the data, I wrote a little program called decode.rb, it's just a Ruby script, and we can feed it with test.pcm, which we can see here. So how it works is that it first detected the edges. The edges are these things. So Whatever these things are edges, and this is what is detected first. Um, 
then it knows that the bursts are one millisecond long. This is one millisecond long, and this is what we see here. It regroups all the edges and considers, ignores, so it starts at this edge, and whatever is within this one millisecond is just ignored and put into a group of pulses. These are the pulses. Then we know that the pulses, the bursts, are separated by at least 12 milliseconds between two, two groups. This is the groups of bursts. This is what the next step which the program does. It separates the bursts from each other. So this is the first burst, this is the second 20-bit burst, and we, because they are separated by at least 12 milliseconds, this is yet the third, and then we have a small garbage just at the end. This is what we see in this step. Afterwards, when we have this group of 24 bits, the last one is is just a blank bit, we check if these are uh, real transmission. So a transmission needs 24 bits and also it has to have a uh, one pulse within 6 milliseconds in this 24 times. This is what I saw here. And then I just from this three transmission I extract the values and this is the values we, which I came from. Um, so these are the, the this is the hex code of the 24 bits. We can see one so we can see all six hexadecimals, which represent 24 bits, and this is just something which I try to decode. So the system code, which we saw in the mega code manufacturer, this is the system code, always starts with one, and then we have the data bits, which are the three last bits in the end. And this is what the, my decoding program does. So now we figured out the remote which frequency it operates, what kind of encoding it uses, um, AM modulation, what, how the code, the mega code code is encoded. We have, we can, since the software device new radio, we can uh, read the code. And as we can see, it's the same code which is repeated all over again. So the remotes don't think uh, with uh, the, the, the gate. They don't have rotating codes which change very often. And this indicates it's very easy to to clone because once you figure out the code, you just have to send exactly the same code over again and you can open the gar garage door. And this is probably simpler, so you can install just a receiver at the garage door, pre-program the, uh, the remotes and tell only open, open on this remote. Um, on each garage door and you don't have to have a central system which manages all, all the all the remote codes. On car keys, which also use remotes, they have a rotating code. So every time you press on the button, it will be an, another code. So in the central system, being the car, there is the initial seed, and then it knows at which position you are, and from the initial seed, it can calculate all the next codes. And every time you press the button, you'll go to the next code. Um, this enables to against this replay attacks, but this also means that every time you transmit, the receiver has to know, okay, he's already at the next code. I will remember this state, and whenever I get the next press, I just calculate the next code from based on the seed and on the previous number, and I can know if it's the right code. For this system, you need a central uh, central management for for the key which can always synchronize with what the remote sends and this is a bit so it costs a bit more money to implement and then you need also to have all receivers synced because I could press to open the garage door but I could also go to the main gates building and press there and if the two systems are not synchronized then at one point I wouldn't be able to open one on the, or, or the other garage door. And having a central system to synchronize the receiver on both sides it costs also a bit more money. Um, this is probably why they implemented it. Here it's the same code which is repeated over and over again. And the security, there's almost no security. So once you have the code, you can reprogram the code. And this is uh, what we will do next. We know that the code can be reprogrammed all the time. Um, 
So we'll try to to flash the device or to flash another device with our code, the program our code in the device. Uh, let's have a look at the device. Let's look again at the device and see if we can flash it with our own code. So we'll open it. Um, these are probably something um, corresponding to the codes we saw when, when it decoded, but I couldn't figure out what they mean. It's also not important what they mean, as long as I respect uh, the same data which is sent, it's really not important. So here we have the batteries, it's battery source, there's nothing else. Um, some resistor, here we can see the antenna which is integrated in the PCB. And then we have the main components. So the microcontroller for responsible for sending the PCB. Here we have the 318 megahertz clock for sending at the right frequency. And then we have some um, small components which are just there to enable the transmission. Here's the coil um, just before the antenna and this is this is the connection to the antenna. And here the button to, to trigger it. But if you look closer, can we zoom? If we look, if we look closer at the microcontroller, actually they use a PIC12C500AA. And in the data sheet, you will see that this is a one-time programmable EEPROM chip. So even if we know where the connections are, it's a microchip PIC, and then we have lots of test points where we could connect to or connect directly to the pins, we won't be able to reflash this device since it's a one-time programmable device with EEPROM. But we won't stop here. So we saw from the PCB that it uses a PIC12C508 and actually you can even see it in the schematics. Um, so. This is schematic. Uh, this schematic shows you where the components are. It even indicates you the seal screen and the reference designators of the components. And there is the second schematic, which tells you what part it uses. So up to four switches, because the ACT uh, 34B has four switches. These are pull-ups, the two batteries. This is the antenna. This is um, the inductor we saw. Here we have a couple of the transistor we saw, the 318 MHz crystal, passive components like caps, diodes, and here the main chip, which is a, again a PIC12508. And then if we look at PIC, you will see that it's an EEPROM based CMOS controller and it's one time programmable only. But if we search a bit longer well, on Amazon or on eBay and we look for mega code remote control, which are compatible to the first one, we can probably see if somebody else did already that because the, the scheme is quite simple. All the FCC document explain almost all the details you know to, to re-implement this protocol. Probably somebody created a clone. So. If we look at the product, you will find here a linear compatible keychain remote by Transmitter Solutions. And what's interesting at this one, so it operates at exactly the same range. It uses the linear mega code. It's compatible with it. Let's look at the product description. Wow, this is slow technical data. That's the name. 318 lip W1K. And on the manufacturer page, Transmitter Solutions, here we have again the 318, probably from megahertz, lip W1K from Monarch actually, the, the Monarch series. We see it's only one button, but what's interesting is this information. It's programmable. It's compatible with the 31B, which we have, and it's also programmable. And if you look at the manual, you will see here a section which is quite interesting, which is called programming. Programming, it doesn't tell you a lot, but it gives an indication which is interesting. The second indication is this FCC ID. We saw already uh, for the first product, the FCC ID is very useful. Um, it provides a lot of documents. 
Sadly, this this one doesn't provide as much dev documents. It just provides the user manual, the setup, the test setup for doing the measurements, so you can prove that you comply to the uh, FCC Part 15 regulation. But it also has one internal picture, and if we look at the internal picture, it's this one. So this is the inside of the remote. The button is red instead of blue, but it's not too important. Two batteries. What's interesting is this detail here. Here you can see we have a programming header. So probably we can really program this microchip here. Here we have the clock again, the antenna, um, some transistors. Here there's even an LED. But the most interesting part is here, this programming header, which is all soldered. So let's buy one of these remotes. And this is the remote. We'll have a look inside to find out which chip it uses. Then these are a bit harder to open than the other one. Ah. So, and on the back we can see again the FCC number, the model number, the FCC ID, and then some, some numbers. Here there's a hole because on this one I already sold it, the programming header which we had. Uh, which we found on the picture, and to access it whenever the gate, uh, when the remote is closed, I just have, I just have this hole, so I can access it all the time. And here is the device, nothing more than two batteries, the oscillator for the 380 megahertz, some components, the LED. Uh, the button is actually on this side. This is the button. Here is again the number which will be transmitted, and here is the microcontroller. And this time. It's a PIC-12F series, um, and the F series, the F in the series stands for flash, so this one is reflashable, and with this headers, we just have to to find out which header is connected to which pin, which programming pin, then we simply get one of the PIC kits, so this is a PIC kit 2 clone. Uh, it's less expensive than the PIC kit 2, but it's I exactly the same hardware. Um, you just have USB on the one side, and then an RG11 on the other side. This is the cable which I already prepared, and then you can plug it on and see if you can talk to the chip. This remote uses uh, the 318 libw1k from Monarch uses a PIC 12F 629. It's flash based. We can reprogram it. And I tried to look with the PIC chip programmer, but they use code protection and also data protection. So you cannot, I cannot read the code which they use the firmware itself, so the code, and I cannot use what value they stored in the EEPROM, and probably they store the value which they want to transmit into EEPROM. Since I cannot read it, I don't know the encoding which they use, um, and but that still won't stop us. We have the chip, we have a programmer, so why not program the chip ourselves? The previous product had actually two schematics which was quite useful. So here we had the schematics. We would know which pin is connected to, to which peripheral, so we could directly implement. But this is not required by the FCC to be to be compliant with Part 15. Actually, you only have to show at which frequency you transmit, uh, at which power, how long, how frequent, um, how good you filter, so how much is the, how much do you transmit in the harmonic frequencies and so on. This is what Monarch shows, but they don't give any schematics and they also don't t talk about the mega code. Linear doesn't have to talk about it, so we're lucky that we found the mega code, but this one doesn't talk about it, so we won't be able to use the schematic. But simply using a multimeter and the data sheet, so this is the microcontroller with some description, blah, blah, blah. And here we have the pinout. So we know which parts should be, which pins uh, do what. And then using the multimeter and the continuity test, I just figured out which pin of the chip is connected to which pin on the programming header we have. And also the other peripherals which they use. So this is very simplified. This is not a complete schematic, but it 
it's enough to understand what uh, what is connected to what. So here we have the programming header. Here we have we can enable the clock the, to have 300 megahertz transmission. Then we have the input switch, which is uh, to ground. So there should be some pull up either external or internal. Here we have a connection to the antenna. So this is where we enable the transmission. Uh, the battery I didn't show, but it's between ground and VCC. And then we have one LED, which is quite nice. So whenever we program the microcontroller, we can at least, at least use the LED to have some debugging output. And so let's go to work and reprogram the, the firmware for this microcontroller now that we know which peripherals it on which side. So here we are. Um, I wrote your firmware. Uh, this is a picture. That's my first pick implementation. I'm more an Atmel guy, and now that I tested also chip, I still prefer Atmel. I think the Linux support is a bit better for Atmel than for chip. But still, it's a microcontroller, and it's not too complicated to to program. Once you understand one, um, you basically understand most of them. They just have slightly different ways how they work. So on the left, you can see the source code which is implemented. It's only 180 um, lines long and it has lots of comments. Here, this is the thing which will send the mega code. On the right, this is the EEPROM which will get flashed and this is where you simply put the code which you want to flash and here we can flash the device. So if we make it, it will compile it using SDCC and if it's compiled, it will flash it uh, using PK2 command. And now we will test the program. So here we have the original command, here we have the 318 W1K uh, remote which we flash with my own firmware and here's the software defined radio and now we want to try if with this remote I can send codes from this remote. Um, again we can see here as the range log to verify it's the same remote it's still acting on 318 MHz. I will stop the recording and if I look at this one up, this is the same code. Uh, you see the, the groups are, are not right, but it's not a perfect scenario right now. Uh, now we want to try the other one. So first we have to look at which frequency it sends to. It should be 300, around 380 megahertz, but it's never exactly 380 megahertz. And the RTL, as you can see, it's more 317.96. Three hundred seventeen to ninety six, and this slight difference is big enough uh, for the RTL FM to make a bit of a difference. So three hundred ninety seven dot eighty six. Up, switch it on, press on the button, and then let's have a look. And now we have the exact same code. If I would have used the 380 MHz, RTLFM wouldn't have found it because um, it decodes AM radio on specifically this frequency and the bandwidth is not very big. But we've proven now that we can get a code from any remote uh, using the software defined radio and we using an off-the-shelf remote which is just twenty dollars we can reflash our own firmware and send the exact same code so now we can really clone remotes and we, can, we have seen that this garage door are not very secure